This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Join the NFTV mailing list for the sickest drops. All right, so tell me how you got into how you got involved with the Curio Card project in what was it, 2016? It was uh, 2016, 2017, and I'd always been a collector. So I collected baseball cards in the 80s, comic books in the 90s. I collected CDs and DVDs, movies and videos and, and music, all those things. So I'd always had a collection uh, of things. And uh, after I started Mad Bitcoins in 2013, and uh, I'd known about Bitcoin before, but I kind of put it in the back of my mind. And in 2013, the Cyprus event came out. And... Uh, What's the, what's the Cyprus event? Well, in uh, Cyprus, they had a lot of foreign money in their banks. And uh, I don't know where the money came from. Maybe Oh, you mean when they, when they went belly up or whatever? Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, maybe it was money. drug money, right? And it was yeah. April of 2013. And the yeah. Cyprus government and the banks, they got together and they decided that everyone in Cyprus should take a haircut. And yeah. for those in the business world, they know a haircut means 10% straight off the top. Uh, so every account with more than a hundred grand in it, which was not a lot of accounts, but the big ones all got a 10% cut. The normal people were frozen out of their banks. They couldn't access the ATMs. They got like a hundred dollars a day. Uh, none yeah. of the cards worked. Everything stopped in Cyprus. And it's at that time that I made the connection between Bitcoin and Cyprus. And while the people of Cyprus didn't have ATMs, Bitcoin ATMs, they didn't have knowledge and meetup groups and access. They didn't know how to use Bitcoin. Uh, but if they did, they would have had this wonderful off ramp, this wonderful safety net that could have saved them from the banks giving them a haircut, you know, unilaterally all of a sudden for something not even related to these people. You know, and, you know, foreign drug money was in the system. The normal people who had more than a certain amount of money, maybe they were going to buy a house or something. Uh, they took a big cut. Right. So I saw that Bitcoin could save that. And when I looked at the Bitcoin ecosystem, I'd looked at it in 2010 uh, when it came out on Slashdot. And I thought it was cool. And my roommate was a computer programmer and he didn't think it was cool. So I kind of put it in the back of my head. I was like, oh yeah, that's internet money. But you know, what does it have to do with me? And uh, when this came out, I looked at Coinbase and BitPay and I was just blown away that there were real companies in this space and they'd made it usable. Uh, when I looked at Bitcoin, it was command line. I saw right away that the early people were gonna be crazy rich. Uh, I thought I missed the boat at a dollar. I thought I missed the boat <laughs> at, uh, at $30. I was like, I am so dumb. Uh, and in, not, not dumb enough to buy any at 30 because it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, that's, that's, I mean, we probably heard about, I, I heard about it at 30. That was when I heard about it the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And then it jumps up to 300 with Cyprus. And I'm like, again, I'm the dumbest person. I could have got this at 30. So I didn't have a lot of money. I was unemployed and I put my savings into a little bit of Bitcoin. And then what do you do next? Well, I, I talked all my friends and family ears off, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, uh, all this stuff. And they're like, okay, we've had enough of you. And so I had a green screen. I had like kind of a little mad Bitcoins costume. Uh, I'd worn it at Burning Man. I used to run a game show there. We had like a big wheel. You could spin the wheel, right. I had a little character, kind of a game show host. And I was like, I looked at the Bitcoin space. And it was April, 2013. And uh, really all there was, was let's talk Bitcoin. And they'd started about three or four weeks ago, not really that much. And they were kind of like NPR. They were like a podcast and they were long form and they were serious. And I, I like Let's Talk Bitcoin a lot. I like Adam and the work he's done. Um, but I wanted something shorter and funnier, right? And on YouTube. And I wanted yeah. to do a YouTube show. So I started doing Mad Bitcoins. I had the crazy background and the green screen. And I did the daily news of Bitcoin for about two years. And I did uh, five shows a week, uh, 600 shows in two years. Uh, yeah. In 2014, I started the World Crypto Network uh, with the idea of being someone other than me talking about Bitcoin. And so we started bringing in people from the internet and giving them shows and just trying to get more people to talk about Bitcoin, uh, thinking that, you know, I had reached the people I was going to reach with mad Bitcoin. So I was going to try to branch yeah. out. So uh, 2014 World Crypto Network. Uh, 2015, I got a job at a Bitcoin startup in San Francisco called BTC Jam. And we did early Bitcoin loans. And we would actually let you take the Bitcoin off the platform. Uh, which is a disastrous and terrible idea in sadly a series of disastrous and terrible ideas <laughs> from BTC Jam. I, I like the people there very much and I was, I was very happy to work in a startup, but their very first idea was anonymous loans. So you could yeah. just show up at the website and say, I need a loan for a car and they would give you the Bitcoin. You'd walk away and they hope you come back and pay. Wow. 
Yeah, they had a lot of faith in people to start with. My friends from uh, from where they, you know, from Beaches Jam, and uh, so that didn't work. And then we tried the other I way. I can't believe was, that didn't work. <laughs> I, the honor system did not work. And then we tried the other way. Where people had IDs, and you would get a loan, and uh, same kind of thing. You tell a story. Uh, my my yep. sister's car broke down, and she needs it to go to work. And give me a couple thousand. And you feel bad, and you give her a hundred bucks, and you never hear from her again. <laughs> and, you don't want to know how much that hundred dollars in Bitcoin is worth now, because that would just make you sad. So, but it was a startup and it was in San Francisco and it was really exciting. And I was glad to be there. And later after that, uh, it didn't work out. I went on to work at purse.io, uh, which is another startup in San Francisco and they're still going. You can get Amazon discounts, uh, for spending Bitcoin. Uh, so it's a pretty cool system as kind of a shopping discount. So it was a way of promoting Bitcoin. Uh, so I worked there for a while, but eventually, you know, startups don't work out. You want to move on to the next project. And at this point, I'd read kind of all the startup books. I'd read Hatching Twitter. I read Crossing the Chasm. I read Zero to One. Uh, all of these things, the Amazon book, the eBay book, the PayPal book, right? So I was yep. pretty much full of like how you start these startups. And I was in San Francisco and I was surrounded by all the right people. Come on, and man. Just roll. It's easy. You just go and have course. lunch with somebody. Boom. You got $2 million. Exactly. Like and I was like, I can make a speech and I can put some slides together on the PowerPoint. Uh, this is me, right? So, um, so I get my friends together and I decide to start my own startup. Uh, so I talked to my friend, Rick Chan, uh, who's our advisor on Curio Cards. And now he's working on a new project called NFT Dash Ventures. And uh, I'm also working with him on that. So that's going to be exciting. I hope to talk about that more in the future. Uh, but I talked to Rick and I also talked to my friend Ryan Singer. And Ryan Singer was early into a Bitcoin exchange called Trade Hill. Uh, he also did work with Blockchain Health, uh, which is, again, years ahead of its time. Uh, he sure. went to Blockchain Health Records. And uh, he did it in a very yeah. honest and great way, but it, they were just so early. He was just so early. Yeah. Dude, and being early is usually wrong, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. It's well, and sa sa my friend Ryan Singer is often early, um, but I, I love him. I love him to death, and I think he's doing really good now. He's on the Chia project uh, with Bram Cohen from BitTorrent. And they're making kind of like a, a green Bitcoin, like an environmentally friendly Bitcoin. There's a lot, so I don't of, know. lot of ask for that, yeah. Yeah, I don't know the details and I don't know how it's going to work, but uh, Bram Cohen's a genius, so I, I wouldn't bet against him. But uh, so, so Rick knows everybody in town. Rick's my like startup guy. And uh, Rick and Ryan both suggest that I meet Rhett Creighton. And Rhett had worked on some projects with Ryan. He'd been a programmer. He's a very serious programmer guy. And what's so great about Rhett is that Rhett and especially when he's you know, given to you as a resume, Rhett is a nuclear engineer trained at MIT. So right. if you're looking to be impressed by a little resume, nuclear engineer trained at MIT comes, comes off pretty good for a programmer, right? You know, you're going to meet a smart guy. And so I meet Rhett, and, and I love Rhett, but Rhett basically is about my age, but he kind of looks like a little kid. <laughs> so right. Rhett just has this kind of youthful personality, youthful look to him. Uh, so you kind of under, undertake him. You think he's not that serious, but when he gets down to the code, he's right on it. And he's very serious. And uh, Rhett also has a fascinating and fun background. Uh, just to tip you guys into this, Rhett used to be a child actor, and uh, he's the little. That I didn't. I, I've been honestly, I've been trying to talk to Rhett for like three weeks now, and he just deleted his Twitter, which I guess happens once in a while, where he just has to get off Twitter. And I'm like, why does he have to get off Twitter? And Travis is like, well, he was involved with some ICOs and he gets, starts getting bombed after a while. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened after Curio Cards. We'll speculate a little about what Rhett was into there. But in the, in the beginning, he was introduced to me as a, as a child actor. Uh, and this is a very big credit I'm about to dump on you. Your mind's going to be blown. I'm ready to watch yeah. it. He's the little kid in Crocodile Dundee 2. Right. <laughs> So he is a major child actor. He was in some commercials awesome. as well. I think he's in a couple other movies and kind of things. And again, this is analogous to Brock Pierce, uh, who was the little kid in Mighty Ducks and then later in First Kid and then became a major sure. Bitcoin and EOS and Ethereum and all these kind of things. So it's very, very funny to see that the child stars come back around. But I got to um, have, I got to talk to Rhett. That's a hard uh, Rhett's, Rhett's the best. So the other, the other thing that Rhett's very famous for is Zcash came out and Zcash famously had this founder's reward. Every block or every month or whatever, they're going to give some money to the founders. And everyone's like, oh, okay, I guess. But of course, Zcash went crazy and the founders got tons of money. But even right. before that happened, Rhett was like, I could fix that. 
So Rhett goes into the code and he takes out the founder's reward and he publishes it at a, as a new cryptocurrency. I think it was called Zen or some kind of thing. And uh, he just sets it out there and he's just a programmer. So he doesn't buy this thing. He doesn't mind this right. thing. He's not looking to make money on this thing. He was just like, oh yeah, they have a founder's reward for their anonymous cryptocurrency. I can Let's edit take that, that away from them. And here's the, take that out. here's a, here's a thing you guys go run with it, make a community. So they made a whole community there. Uh, there's ups and downs about that. I don't, is there's be private and all these things. I don't know anything about it, but all I know is if you got a founder's reward in there, Rhett will go in and edit it out. Right? He's so, going to take that away from you. <laughs> he's going to take that away from you. You can do it in the code. So, uh, Rhett well, is the guy, the, obviously without even talking to him and knowing very little about him, he's obviously a, an innovative. I mean, this guy's right at the forefront of development. It's pretty amazing. Absolutely. And all these ideas that are important in Curio cards, uh, you know, we might come up with the framework and we may discuss them, but Rhett's the one that makes them happen. When it comes to the vending machine that you send money to and it comes out with a card, that's Rhett. When it comes to locking down the cards to a 1.0 value, which right. actually broke some of the exchanges like Ether Delta, they were looking for 0.1s and 0.2s and we're like, no, Curio cards are a card. They are indivisible. Right. They are, you know, one thing. And this was a brand right. new concept idea at the time. No one else was doing that. And, and Rhett got it done in the code. You know, I can say it as an idea. It should be a baseball card. Uh, but Rhett's right. the one that made them baseball cards. Made it work. Yep. Amazing. So, so we How get together. You, so, so you had met Rhett before uh, Curio then. You, would, you knew him. Tell me a little bit about how that team formed around Curio Cards. Sure. Well, we, we had a, a little company that we'd started by then called uh, Mother.Tech. And I'd advise anyone not to buy a .tech domain name. That just costs more money. It sounded cool at the time, but yeah, on long term, don't buy a fancy domain name. But uh, our idea there was like, what kind of startups can we make? So we started brainstorming other ideas uh, in addition to Bitcoin and Ethereum that were already on the market. And there's a lot of cool ideas that we thought of that still haven't been implemented. So I'm not going to give those away, but I still have lots of cool ideas about things we can do with NFTs and other things in Bitcoin and smart contracts uh, that could benefit all kinds of groups of people. So we were looking for like the right one. And again, you're looking for kind of MVP, the simplest thing that you could do to test your idea, see if this works. And that's where we came up with the idea for a Curio cards, uh, which were again, based on baseball cards, uh, they're based on my friend Andreas Antonopoulos on one of our first shows in 2013, 2014. Uh, he said that at some point there's going to be Joey coin and the kids right. on the yard will have Joey coin and they'll have Freddie coin and Joey's more popular than Freddie. So you're going to want those Joey coins more. So they're going to have more value. And they're Joey's for a Freddie. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he, he was just matter of fact about it. And uh, before Bitcoin maximalism, before Vitalik broke off and launched his project, before all of that, even Andreas was just saying, very matter of fact, there's going to be lots of coins, you know, and maybe too many, maybe like a billion coins, maybe a million coins, maybe, you know, yeah. really lots and lots of coins. But again, we're, we're not saying we can stop this. You know, this is the ocean. This is the wave. We're not looking to stop this. So uh, rare Pepe's were out. Uh, I had collectibles. I knew, I understood how collectibles work. Uh, you're buying a string of letters and numbers, but to you, it is a collectible. Uh, when I buy an REM program or an REM thing for my REM collection, it doesn't have monetary value. It has collectible value. I'm buying it because I want it because my collection's incomplete without it. Uh, I'd played right. magic cards. I knew how the packs work and the boosters and the, the sets, and you want to get a complete set. And just all these collector's mechanics is what we wanted to bring to it. Uh, now, there was another project on the line, and I want to give them respect. Rare Pepe was there. Now, a very funny story. I'll try to tell you about how I discovered Rare Pepe's and that it was even a real thing. Um, so I was doing the Bitcoin group, and it's a roundtable discussion group, and we still do it to this day. And my friend Theo Goodman was on there. And one day, Theo just started talking about Rare Pepe's. And we thought that he kind of made it up. I didn't even know it was a real project. I was like, Theo's just got a joke that he keeps coming back to. He keeps saying that rare Pepe's are going to solve this problem. And you come to him and you say, China's, China's banning Bitcoin. And he says, rare they Pepe's. They'll never ban Pepe's. Pepe's. They'll never ban Pepe's. Exactly. He was just all about, and I wasn't sure what had happened to Theo. And um, right. he was mad about this on Twitter recently, and I want to address it. And what we did is we were like, okay, I figured out it was a product and it was a real thing. And we're like, okay, right. just plug it once at the end of the show. You know, don't make every answer about it. It's cool. I know you're excited. I don't want to you know, dampen your excitement, but you know, we, do, we plug things at the end of the show. So he, he did that and it was fine. And there's another parallel story about rare Pepe's ruining friendships. 
uh, that I want to tell. There was a show called um, Bitcoin Uncensored. And it was really uh, great. And they were like very in your face, like the title would show. And Chris DeRose and Junseth uh, did the show. And they're very, you know, strident characters, you know, very serious, very, you know, out there. And um, same kind of thing. They had policies that like, we don't plug things on the show, right? We're, we tell people the truth. If you want to get an interest in a company or whatever, well, Junseth started plugging these rare Pepe's. And later on, from this is the rumor, I don't know the actual there, I wasn't there, but from the rumor, yeah. um, Junseth had a bunch of rare Pepe's. So he's plugging a thing that he has a lot of, and at some point, according to the rumor, Junseth sells the rare Pepe's for $35,000 that he uses to build a new kitchen. And <laughs> this, is, this is the straw that breaks the candle's back of Bitcoin Uncensored. Chris DeRose goes off on his friend, Junseth goes his own way, they both do similar projects, never to the same success. They were great together. They had a magic. And according to the rumors of the internet, it was broken up by a $35,000 kitchen and the rare Pepe's. Those, thir so, those $35,000 rare Pepe's are now worth $8.7 million. He sold out too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that would be the last laugh and the funny thing there. And I don't know if Chris got any or I hope Theo Well, trust me, and, uh, I do know, this. I've actually chatted with him, the actual... Um, the artist behind rare Pepe's is actually doing his first NFTs uh, like in the, in the coming weeks. And I, because there's so many scams going on, I actually reached out to him by email, like snail mail by email uh, to his actual website to make sure it was really him because it was on this alternative platform. It wasn't on like OpenSea or anything where there'd be any sort of checking. And he wrote me back nice enough. He's like, yeah, that's me. Uh, we're doing it. I'm doing it with my mic you know, brother or whatever built this platform. And like, so he's actually getting in the space, but let me ask you, were you those NF, those rare Pepe's that was on Bitcoin, right? Through like counterparty or how were, how were people trading those rare Pepe's at that time? Yeah. Rare Pepe's were on counterparty and counterparty was built on top of Bitcoin. And I don't know the details or if it was built wrong or whatever, but there wasn't really an auction. There wasn't really a way to buy these. There was yeah. kind of a way to send them around, but that just the other features that you needed weren't there to yeah. really make a market for these things. Uh, yeah. Additionally, when I looked at them, you know, as a business analyzing them, uh, Rare Pepe's had a lot of negatives around them. The oh, Rare yeah. Pepe, the Pepe mascot, while I, I'm internet, I know the history, he was smiling funny frog and he'd laugh at people, right? And we'd be like, ah, oh, smiley frog, he's laughing at someone's misfortune. But it became very sad. The internet is as it is. And, you know, people that I disagree with, white supremacists and Nazis and other kind of people started using Pepe the, Flat, the Frog for their purposes, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So rare, Pepe the Frog has very questionable history. Now, I think that the Rare Pepe Project was trying to restore Rare Pepe or Pepe, and they're trying to bring the honor of Rare Pepe. The honor of Pepe. And <laughs> Pepe the, before the alt-right got exactly. a hold of Exactly. <laughs> but I, I felt that was an incredible hill to battle. That was fighting the ocean. Um, and I also thought that by having such a tight theme of kind of magic cards where half the right. card is a box of text and the art's really small and then having all of the art painted green, like there's different parts of Rare Pepe art, but it is all tinted green. It's very mm -hmm. tight to its focus. So uh, I thought that there was very obvious opportunity for a cartoony mascot that had no hate in it and for a project that was just more open and didn't have a theme didn't have to be tightened down to this magic card green theme. So how'd you get the Rhett? So was Rhett the first one you met uh, involved in the project? Or tell me how the whole kind of team formed and how it got got all put together. Sure, well, mainly Rick and I were the, he was the advisor advising me and Ryan as well. And we brought Rhett, Rhett on was very important because he was the tech, right? He was gonna solve the actual problem. Uh, Travis, I knew Travis from the San Francisco Bitcoin meetup. And uh, Travis had been coming to the meetups as I had Isabella, Isabel and uh, Paige ran the meetup. And uh, so we were just helping out, setting up chairs, um, tweeting about it, things that we could do to improve the meetup. And uh, later on, I became one of the organizers with them. And later on, I, uh, I recruited Travis uh, to help organize the meetup. And he did a great job uh, with all the logistics and scheduling uh, speakers and locations. It was very hard to get a Bitcoin meetup location like a regular one in San Francisco. Uh, it's a startup community. There's a lot of speeches, a lot of groups having speeches. And sure. uh, one of the other neat things about San Francisco is that you have to provide free beer and pizza. Otherwise, the startup people will not come. 
Like the, the engineers are used to free pizza at they're all. They're used to free meetings. stuff. It's they're San used to free pizza at all of their get-togethers, and they'll get to your meetup. They'll stack three free three free pieces of pizza on top of each other, and then they'll go to their seat and devour it. Right. And it's just a normal day for the life of an engineer in San Francisco. You never pay for yeah, it. Yeah. So we had to have all that. So it was a very. But you had to have some money together to get. You had to have some money. money. You had to have some sponsorships. It wasn't just like a pizza place meetup. It was a complex meetup that Travis was running. And uh, yep. he helped me and, and Isabel and Paige run it. Uh, so we were all together. And um, so we had Rhett on as the tech. Then we brought Travis on as kind of like business development uh, to help us get some VC, make some speeches, spread the word about Curio cards. And um, then uh, we were pretty much off. So as far as I was concerned, it was a matter of making an MVP, uh, a minimal viable product where we could test out the theory of Curio cards and how it would work. This was in the era of ICOs and ERC-20 tokens. Uh, so we, we looked at the other projects. Um, Rhett and I's initial impression of Ethereum was that they were going to have scaling problems and they were going to have gas fee problems in the future. And we were right about both of those things. Ding, ding. <laughs> it, uh, it doesn't matter though, because the value of Ethereum from the pre-sale and whatever went up like crazy and the VC interest right. and all of that community formed around it, regardless of these obvious technical flaws. So yep. one of the first ideas we had is that we would make a copy of Ethereum, uh, call it Curio Ethereum. And then oh, we, own, we own all the Ethereum, which is great. Oh my God. Uh, but then we have to mine the Ethereum and we have to oh my God. And all those Can things. Can you so imagine those... if you'd done that? <laughs> well, I, I think that's what CryptoKitties did. They got the money and they went out and made their own crypto kitty Ethereum. And then I don't know what they did for NBA top shops, probably the same kind of thing. But um, so yeah, it was an idea and it, it might've worked. And what would have been interesting about that is that the cards would have been orphaned on their own chain and no one would have been mining it and no one would have been looking for them. And they might've been historically significant, like worth a footnote in the Wikipedia, but I don't know that they would have had the same effect. So we didn't go in that direction. Uh, we went towards uh, this idea of printing the cards every Tuesday. And every mm -hmm. Tuesday, we'd have a YouTube show uh, with Travis and I called like New Card Tuesday, and we would promote the new cards. And so we started out, uh, I have a, you know, I've studied English literature, I have a, a history background. Uh, so I knew we wanted to do something really special for the first card. So of course, we chose the apple, uh, which represents right. the fall from grace and Adam and Eve and all that kind of stuff, plus Apple computer, plus it starts with A, all those things like Steve Jobs said. Right. So you can't go wrong with an apple. Um, we also told this little story and it, it's been found, but no one's paying attention to it, but it's on Bitcoin talk. And if there was an author out there that wanted to make a storybook version of it, I think it would be a great little storybook. But uh, as you can tell from the cards, uh, they do kind of tell an obvious story. So it's you know, apples, nuts, and berries. Um, mm -hmm. So you're getting kind of sustenance. You're getting the things that feed you. And there's a little uh, hidden reference to a talking head song there that no one seems to get uh, where he says, you know, animals, uh, they say they don't need money. They're living on nuts and berries. Uh, they say animals are hairy. You know, they, you know, they don't need money. They're living on nuts and berries. He says it over and over. But so, you know, starting out, you've got your sustenance. You've got your start on the way. Uh, then I think the next three cards are kind of like introduction to art. Like you're learning how to write. You're learning how to read. You're learning how to sculpt. And then it's like the painting cards. You're like becoming good at art. You're becoming good at, you know, books and communicating in the world. And you're growing in as an adult. And then 10 was the future card. And this mm -hmm. is like off into the future. And you're, you're going off on your path, on your journey. And very much the artist's journey uh, kind of thing. So those are the first 10 cards. And the goal there, as you've noticed with the, the 100,000 uh, runs, is that right. we kind of wanted to do um, like an ICO. <laughs> but not really an ICO. We wanted to sell these collector's cards that were the product. This again, I, I do this thing where I deliver the thing and the thing is the thing and that's it. And it never changes. And this, this is what I delivered and it is the thing I delivered. And if you want to invest in me, I will keep delivering these. And uh, right. that, that was our, our value proposition. So the first 10 was like a way to try to raise money for the company. And as you can sell from the sales figures, it did not raise money for the it company. It did not raise money. Although I love, there's a, a couple of fun interviews with Travis from back in the day where, you know, he's being interviewed like a, the founder of a tech startup, right? So what are your numbers? You know, and he's like, well, we had a, we're, and it's like, man, this is, we had a really good uh, people try really buying the cards. We've got people interested. It's like, no, they're not, man. No, and there's no <laughs> he's way trying to, come, to sell it. He's doing he's the best. He try can. It. I know. And there's no way to come back from that either. Cause the numbers aren't there. And then it becomes yeah. a matter of, oh, you, 
if we'd had a better website or if we had better marketing or whatever it was. But for me, it was like, this is an MVP. Uh, we have the, the Fiverr mascot who I like. He has an infinite symbol around his head. He has the infinity logo right there. There's an eight around his thing, which again, Kira cards are forever. It's infinite. They last forever. Um, so if you haven't seen this mascot, it's basically, it's, it's a, a raccoon, right? And it's morphed over time. It's a little bit different on the website now. I found the old ones that are still floating around on like Facebook. Um, and, and I think Travis said, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but said basically they went on Fiverr and had it done, you know, got it done on Fiverr. Um, yeah, a little that was it. First, first take five bucks. I described, I wanted the mask to look like an eight. Uh, the guy had a cartoony feeling like I just thought it was great. I had the logo on his uh, chest to CC for curio cards and uh, couldn't be the furthest thing from rare Pepe's, right? Okay. Very friendly, welcoming, positive. And uh, again, all of this is just, you know, we know what we're doing. We're putting, you know, stuff on top of these tokens. We're selling yeah. tokens. We're selling these very unique strings of letters and numbers that are very unique, are provable unique, are provably rare. There's a lot of the collector's things in a baseball card where you know you have to do a lot of work to discover the minting and the rarity and the quality and if it's a real card, all those things. These things sure. are provably real. These are you know yep. authentic. They are the thing that they are. Um, so I, we've tried ways to explain that to people through the baseball card metaphor and through yep. this, the artist metaphor. So after uh, the first 10, uh, we, you know, we're going to continue with the project regardless of the low sales and all these kinds of things. My thing with mad bitcoins and a lot of my other projects is uh, the internet respects you if you have a good work ethic. And when I came back every day and I did my five days a week for two years, the internet was like, that mad bitcoins guy comes back every day. Like, it doesn't matter what you say about him, if you watch him, if you don't watch him, if it's important to you, if you care about bitcoin or whatever. This guy believes in bitcoin, he believes in entertaining and informing us and, uh, you know, it's... It doesn't pay well, but you know, it's a job he's going to keep doing it seems so until yeah. he can be stopped. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. so we're releasing cards every Tuesday. So we started to reach out to our artist friends, uh, through the San Francisco Bitcoin meetup. So I know, uh, crypto graffiti and he was already doing incredible work there. And just, just as you say about the NFTs in the last interview about you missed your chance to buy a bunch of the early ones, I missed my chance to buy crypto graffiti artwork. Um, because he was just my friend and you never yeah. think like I should spend never thousands, be anything. thousands of dollars already at that point. Cause he was a trained yeah. artist and he was making real work and he wanted thousands of dollars for it. And I'm a, you know, poor kid paying my San Francisco rent, struggling through the startups, you know, someday I'm going to make money. Someday I'm going to make money yeah. and the rent's real big and the Uber bill is real big. And, uh, so yeah, I didn't buy his art. Um, but my friend Jesse at Kraken did. And I yeah. think he's killing it now. And <laughs> I hope that Crypto Graffiti does well with his new art. But yeah, so he donated some uh, cool Bitcoin logos to us. And uh, yep. what's so funny is that the, these cards are on Ethereum and it's clearly an Ethereum thing. But uh, our first 10 like artist cards or whatever are all Bitcoin propaganda. So uh, we do the, the Bitcoin logos. On the Ethereum blockchain. <laughs> on the Ethereum blockchain, unapologetic, like sticking yep. with what I, I come with. You know, this is yep. what I am. Um, so, you know, Crypto Graffiti does the three logos. Uh, I knew Philippe uh, just from the internet. He had just kind of popped up and started making Mad Bitcoins uh, movie posters. Like he'd take my oh, face cool. and put me in a movie poster. I just loved it. I always dreamed that the internet oh, yeah. would help me with my project and just come along. And, and that's what Philippe is for me is he's that, that dream where sometimes I think, that I am Philippe and then I go to sleep and I make photoshops of myself and I, you know, I'm Tyler Durden and I invented Bitcoin and all those things, but no, Philippe's real somehow, I, I suppose. And, uh, or I have a, you know, major problem, but, um, so he's out there and he makes the cards and he does, uh, some Bitcoin parody logos for us, like Wendy's and, uh, Heineken. Yeah. I love those. And, ones, and, yeah. yeah. And they're super fun and they're colorful too. Uh, going yeah. back to, there's no, no theme for these cards. I'm not telling the artist it has to look a certain way. The only real theme is that I'm numbering them and then we know number one, number two, and that the numbers continued on the artist cards. Uh, so we do the Finip cards. Uh, then we do the crypto pop cards. Uh, I just talked to Luis the other day. He's doing really well with NFTs. Yep. And uh, Luis was a friend of Rick, uh, our original advisor on the project. So Rick brought him in and same kind of thing. A couple of emails. Do you want to contribute some art? And uh, now was he li was he in California or he was he living in wherever he is Philippines or wherever he is uh, now? Was he was he virtual or was he in California with you guys? I, I think we agreed in our meeting yesterday. We'd never actually met. 
And I don't yeah. think we'd even met on a video call or an audio call or yeah. anything like that. It was a different era of the internet. It was a lot more emails. Yeah. And it was just kind of like Rick had a friend that did art. And I don't even think he'd done that many of his like Bitcoin number series where he's doing 50,000 and 51,000 and things like that. Uh, he hadn't really started that. And, but he had these three works, which were the dogs uh, trying out the UASF, the dogs on the rocket ship to the moon. Yeah. And then the dogs playing poker with the altcoins, which again, it's all funny. The, 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 the vibe I get from the community is like, those are the people love those cards. They love that dog in the pool card. I don't know why, you know, I guess it's teach his own, like what, you know, artist in the eye of the beholder, but the community loves those cards. It has a, it has a really good cartoony feel like a comic strip. And then I think yep. that the, the things he's drawing about were actually really important in the time, but to see them in a cartoony way. And uh, maybe this is a good chance to talk about card 17, right? The UASF card. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was very much involved in the Bitcoin scaling war and people can go back and watch my videos, my interviews and read my tweets. I was on the side of UASF. I'm a small blocker. I didn't think that we needed to make Bitcoin bigger for no reason. I always kind of use the airplane analogy. I say that Bitcoin is like an airplane that's traveling around the world 24 seven. It's refueling midair. And uh, we don't want to add any weight to this plane. Like, we want to be very careful about the adjustments that we do on affecting this system that's going around the world constantly because we can't stop it to fix it or repair it. Right. Um, so just based on that, I was for the small blocks and the UASF, which uh, won the war and defeated it. So uh, Luis's card uh, was uh, celebrating that UASF and it was also showing uh, how tentative Bitcoin was about it. Bitcoin was putting its a toe in the water just there. Dip in, toe just dipping toe in, right? dip. And remember we had uh, Litecoin had gone before us activating uh, SegWit on the Lightning Network and they were successful and they were a good test net for Bitcoin. And also Litecoin didn't have the politics that Bitcoin had. Bitcoin had politics and minor interests and other things that were preventing it from installing SegWit. Uh, there's a question at the time we didn't know, but we found out later uh, that Bitmain was running software called ASIC Boost that allowed them to basically get ahead of the next block and guess it faster, which uh, made them lots of money, but would have been broken if you switched to SegWit because of the way that it moved the witness from inside the block to outside the block. Uh, so there was kind of a you know, hideous uh, secret co corporate interest in there, right? It was insidious and uh, it was there. Uh, but so the 17 card comes out and as I remember in the time period, and, and it's hard to think back, so just constructing these, but I think Rhett made a mistake on it. I think Rhett told me something like I was, it was late night. I screwed up the contract. I had to do it twice. And you know, you're, I was the, you know, CEO type person and we're all very equal. You know, I don't want to say right. like big boss CEO is very equal, but um, so yeah, I'm like, oh, I just kind of shrug it off. I'm like, oh, Rhett, Rhett messed up a contract. You know, it cost us some ether. That's fine. We got some more. The other thing came out. We can do our show and we can launch the cards and the artist can be happy and everything you know, moves forward. Uh, so I think nothing of it. But during the rediscovery of these curio cards, yes. uh, this 17 card uh, was discovered as this alternate contract. And it couldn't right. have happened on a better card, right? Because this is UASF that uh, happened. What happened with the fork is, you know, Bitcoin went one way with SegWit. And a lot of other people, the big blockers, started their own coin, Bitcoin Cash, and they fo forked off from Bitcoin. So there was two Bitcoins. And just like in our cards, by, I think, a lucky accident, there were two 17 cards. Two 17s. And Whether he, he just pushed send twice, or I guess we'll never really know. Um, I but I do we'll know, we ask talking right. with Travis, it was la it's labor intensive, right? Each one was done individually there's no way to do multiple ones at the same time so you know it, you can see how you know people make mistakes and so now this is now a lot of this programming language like the yeah. solidity solidity programming language wasn't developed i've heard things like you had to do a bunch of if thens in a row because there wasn't more complex logic so you can right. build like a while do out of some if thens it's just super confusing and he was having to do things like that additionally as i think travis mentioned on your show the other day uh, for the first three or the first couple sets, we were doing different prices. We thought yeah. that the problem people weren't buying these is because they weren't cheap enough. Pricing. So we would sell like the first hundred for a quarter and the second right. hundred for 50 cents. And then the rest of them you could buy for a dollar. And right. it, it did kind of work. I mean, people would clean out the lower level 
priced ones first. Um, it did. I don't know that it led to some kind of fervor where they bought the rest. But, right. Uh, eventually, we were like, okay, you know, less work for Rhett. Just do the normal dollar pricing. We're just going to standardize. And um, but yeah, so the 17 card was a mistake. And uh, as it turned out, when the people rediscovered these curio cards, and we can talk about more later, but uh, people were able to buy this error card. So I, I don't know if Travis saw this or not, but this put a lot of people in the interest that they wanted this error card to be sold and to be a part of the set, and they would do anything to make that possible. And I think it put them in a hard position later on. But for whatever reason, there's a, a strange fork on the 17 card. Um, mm -hmm. But going, going back to the other cards, so we had a, a form on the website uh, where you could submit to be a curio artist. And I think this is a great form, and I, I think we're going to make a, a similar one for NFT-Ventures. And anyone can just submit. I want to be an artist. Here's my Flickr. Here's my gallery webpage. Uh, we come look at it. You don't have to know anything technical. We're going to do all the hard work and the Ethereum and stuff. You just give us some images and we're going to make some tokens for you, some unique collectible tokens. Um, yep. So we put the form out and we looked through the entries. And lo and behold, we found uh, Daniel Friedman's entry. And what I liked about it, he had a Flickr page with lots of other artwork. It was clearly hand drawn with the, the pen and the ink. It wasn't a yep. copy of someone. It wasn't a parody. There was no kind of like questionable law issues we'd have to worry about. So uh, we brought him on board to be a curio artist. Uh, he chose very interestingly to do 333, 222, and 111. Uh, we yep. were letting the artists choose their own uh, by then. And uh, yeah, he, he, we just put his cards out. Uh, I listened to your interview. I guess he's a, a network technician or something now. He's not yeah, an yeah. artist or involved in the space. And he was very surprised and I think happy and, and pleased. I liked his attitude that he was like, I just applied for contests. I was like, there was a contest for Curio Card, so I applied to it. There's a contest yep. for this, so I applied to it. I put my work on Flickr because why not? You know, yep. and I just, he had a great attitude towards spreading his art and, and his art being kind of a hobby. Um, so he really thought, did. I, you know, when I got into the crypto and he's like, look, Crypto giveth and crypto taketh away. You can't worry about this stuff. <laughs> you know, he had no worries about, you know, he was in a very good spot place with um, his little contribution and was happy that he was a part of it, I think was, was his general feeling. And I'd definitely like to talk to him more in the future. I think he's an interesting guy. I'd love to get his story. So also yep. there was uh, Robeck, uh, who I'm not sure if we met the same way, or he might have just been part of the Curio Cards community. Uh, for as strange as it was, we had you know, five or 10 people that were fans of us. I think Moon was there and he made a gallery for us. And some of Travis's friends were there and they were hanging out. And I'm sure, I invited all my friends and they didn't come. But um, <laughs> yes, we had we had five or six people that were into the project and they were making like little galleries and little things. And I think Robeck was one of those. And he was working with Moon and Kian and some of these early people. And uh, yeah. Robeck has this whole alternative ego he runs a cartoon and he has robux world and he draws cartoons. interesting cat <laughs> absolutely uh, especially if you check out my mad bitcoins interview with robeck we both did it in oh no bed. i haven't seen oh my god oh no. yeah no it's on the the mad bitcoins channel and it's all about the curio cards and it's one of it's it was one of the uh like uh, new card tuesdays but for that one it was like a special i did it on the mad bitcoins channel because robeck with his costume was worthy of mad bitcoins and his costume gotcha. i had to like gotcha. take it up a level um, so yeah, that one's out there. And so we get Robeck and he does little cartoons and it's great. So, um, we did number 20, which is, uh, Finit put, uh, you know, mad Bitcoin's head on James Bond's body. And I thought yeah. that was That's great. That's like one of my and favorites. I, I think it's super awesome. You must love that one, right? I, it's, it was awesome. And well, in the, in the time, again, everything has a, a perspective. So in the time it was supposed to raise money for mad Bitcoins, I was going to use it for cameras and microphones and travel money and whatever. And, uh, you know, it didn't. Bought it, a pack it, of gum. <laughs> yeah, no. And even then I'm, you know, I had to buy some of the cards too. So I'm losing money on this. I'm, you know, dumping my own thing. Cause I had to buy my own sure. card. What am I doing? So, but, um, so yeah, it didn't go. And then we do the Robux cards where I, I don't know if we'd already, I, well, we did it to celebrate the team. I don't know if we're egoists or whatever we are, but there was already a Mad Bitcoins card, so why not a Travis and a Rhett? Um, so they, and they did another Mad Bitcoins just to round out the set. And um, right. so, yeah, there's the Wizard, uh, Mad Bitcoins, the Bard, clearly Travis, you know, spreading the word about Kira cards, and then Rhett, the muscle guy, uh, which, again, right. just Rhett is our hero here. Rhett makes the cards. Rhett makes the contracts. Rhett does the Ethereum work that I didn't want to do or learn about and all that, so... You know, all, all power to Rhett here. I want to see him lifted up. And that's another reason I think 
Oh, we did a little animation for Rhett. His card blinks and flexes. And flexes, I don't know yeah. the history and all that, but maybe it's the first animated NFT. I don't know. It was hard <laughs> to do. You can see there aren't a lot of frames. They had to load it into the IPFS. It had to be a certain size. Uh, you can talk to Roback for the details. But yeah, he had to make that small. And, and that wasn't easy to do. So we do a little animated NFT there. Maybe another little checkbox for the thing. Travis has his uh, number on the other side because uh, it wouldn't work with the artwork otherwise. So that's kind of fun. A uh, little accidental, little baseball card details that we're doing here. And uh, then we do the Daniel cards. Um, then um, we do the Marisol Vangus cards. And they're really interesting because and these might be the first fine art NFTs where it's mm -hmm. not just like a computer image or it's not just like a drawing of somebody's cartoon, uh, but this is actually like a process. And I, I don't know how... Uh, the Marisol Vengas Collective did the art, but it looks like a picture of a building, maybe a layer of, of color, maybe another layer right. of color. It has like a transformative effect to it where I, I put it in a different category, whether you like it or not. You know, it's 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 clearly trying to do something that the others weren't. Um, so yeah. now, of course, he, he's come out publicly, so I don't want to rain on him. But uh, my friend Max uh, was involved. Max Infeld was involved in setting up Marisol Vengas Collective and all these kind of things. He's a big artist yeah, see, Chico. It's so interesting because now I've gone down this rabbit hole with artists. And obviously I don't have a lot of artist friends because I've been blown away by this like, wait, who is, who's the owner? Like Marisol, but then I get Max and what's going, I don't even know who's who. Is this a man? Is this a woman? I don't know what's going on here. I'm confused. I'm, I'm okay. But this is very confusing to me. Like, I did not. It took me a while to figure out who the heck is who here. Well, and it, it seems strange at first. And you're like, oh, no one no one has aliases and other names. And then you're like, wait a minute. Robeck. Robeck's Everybody's computer, got an alias. Mad Bitcoins. You know, and you're, you're going down the line and you're like, this is becoming very common. Like, it's, people. It's, people's it's not his real thing. name. I, I mean, mean, this is, as I've gone down NFTs, this is the whole thing. But Curio just, like, super highlighted it. Because honestly, between you, uh, Mad Bitcoin, and fin is it Finip or whatever? I'm like, is this the same person? You're Finip. I forgot about Finip too. Yeah. Finip. I'm like, is this Finip's you? You wait, are you Finip? Uh, Finip did the Mad Bitcoin. I, I was confused. <laughs> and and yeah, it, it's been uh, an eye opener for sure, and very interesting uh, across the entire space. It's not just with Curio, but across the entire space. I could go on for days about just stuff where I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Because uh, they're artists. At the end of the day, you're dealing with a lot of art and, you know, they're just, they're unique, right? Well, and, and there's own. something, there's something art in having a, um, a secret identity and there's something art about how you use it. And if you expose That's yourself right. and you know, I've read books by anonymous and multiple <laughs> anonymouses, you know, so uh, it's out there. But yeah, so we did so the, the Maris. So clarify that though for us now, so I can understand this. So Marisol is not a person. This was Max and other people as well, or just basically Max doing this art as an alias space. Well, there needs to be entire books written on Max. They need to get whoever wrote about Andy Warhol and they need to go out to Max because Max is not only into all these art projects in Chico and he's a professor of art there and he does all kinds of things and he involves his community. Um, but originally Max was doing these things called monetary units and they were like a currency. Uh, but for anyone else, you would just print out a bunch of photocopies of your currency, but not Max. He had them individually serialized. So he had armies of people that were individually serializing these, these bills that had QR codes on them. And Max was the first artist I saw who used the QR code and he used it in some incredible works. Uh, there was a series I saw once in a friend's bathroom and I, I'm not proud, but I talk about this series all the time because I thought it was so fun and Max did it. And I know what happened to it or if, if it ended up in a museum or not, but you know, you're in the, you're in the restroom and you're browsing your friend's art on the walls. Right. And it's, um, it's pornographic pictures. Right. Okay. But there's a big QR code covering up the good stuff. So oh. you've got a phone in your pocket and you got a QR right. code reader and you're curious. So bing, uh, your QR code goes to the image, you know, porn, good stuff, bing, porn, good stuff, bing. And you get to the last one, bing, and it flips it on you. It's a chick with a dick. And you're like, oh, <laughs> surprise, like story, all these things come together. It was just, I was getting porn, 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 and then surprise. And I was like, what a great use of the QR code, you know, covering up the art. It's appropriate. Kids could look at it. It's all covered up unless you know the magic. 
and just what a great little magic art and just in a restroom in a, not an art museum um you can go through that adventure and and he was just way ahead of his time with the qr code that was one of the yep. reasons i should have seen bitcoin as well because i was supposed to be on the lookout for art with a qr code bitcoin had a qr code so max has done all kinds of projects like that i don't know the details of the marisol vingas collective uh, but i do know he did a lot of this series with the buildings and the colors and the plants and the colors and so they had some kind of a process and I remember early artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, they had all these uh, apprentices in their offices that were doing work that later got sent out as Michelangelo. Uh, so I don't think it's that different with Max and sure. he's got a team of artists and they're working on all kinds of new projects and he's really taken to the modern NFTs. He's making lots of them on wax and uh, he's just fired up. So uh, I, I had known Max through my brother and we went to Burning Man together. And so when I thought of artists to include in my little NFT, or we call them digital collectible art project, um, yeah. I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll get Max, you know? And so he donated some pieces and he wanted to be called Marisol Vengas. And, you know, I'm fine. I just shrug my shoulders, whatever you want to be so called. It doesn't matter to me. So we put the Max ones out. Um, there was something interesting I want to talk about in the later numbers. When we started doing the Robex cards, Daniel cards, and then the Max cards, uh, the artists were requesting lower and lower numbers. And at right. one point, uh, we had a little feeling of success. Uh, the Robex cards sold out like before I could get any, before Robex could get any. They, the, some guy came along and bought like hundreds of each card. Uh, oh, we wow. don't know who this whale was. We thought he might have been a lost ICO person, and he right. thought he was killing it on some ICO. And uh, so he bought our cards and I thought for a long time that it was Rick, our advisor, and that he was just yep. really smart and he was buying our cards. And later on, now that these cards are worth a little money, I go to Rick, I'm like, hey, did you buy all our cards? He's like, no, man, I don't have any. I'm scrambling to get a set. I'm trying to, you know, collect them right. on the market. And um, so we don't know who he was, but this whale with a real, a real whale comes along and buys hundreds of these cards. And especially when we got to the uh, 333-222-111, the whale pretty much bought them all. So that guy or, or gal is still out there and I don't know why they bought them and what they're going to do with them. Um, but that same kind of thing kept happening on the lower number cards. So, but still it's not, you know, it wasn't a community. It wasn't on fire. We weren't, you know, selling out really. So uh, we keep making the cards and then we come to the eclipse card and uh, I don't know Thoros of Mir. I do want to find out because I, I like you. I want to interview. Yeah, tell all, me what. It, yeah, I was going to. I want to interview all the curio card people myself. I'm definitely into that. The same game that you're in. But uh, um, so, yeah, I, I think Thoros is a friend of Travis's. But the same thing, we wanted to make another animated card. This card is much more animated. You can kind of see the dithering and the smaller frames of a GIF in there. Um, but it's of the eclipse. And in 2017, there was a very famous eclipse that you could see from the United States. And in San Francisco, I had the little eclipse graphics and, or glasses. And I went out on the roof at lunchtime and I saw the eclipse in the sky. And uh, that's what the eclipse card was, is we timed the card to be released on the day of the eclipse. And oh, wow. it was okay. another animated card. And it was, you know, special lined up with the, the planets and everything kind of, you know, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that history about that. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. It, linked, it linked right up to the eclipse. And um, as it turned out, it was kind of like a nice metaphor for curio cards, like curio cards was an eclipse. And we did a uh, new card Tuesdays every Tuesday for uh, seven, eight weeks in a row there. And then we didn't and we made new cards and then we didn't and the, the project went away. And then what's really nice about this modern eclipse is that it came back uh, later yep. on. So uh, after we did the eclipse card, uh, you know, obviously we weren't having success as a startup, the MVP wasn't working. Uh, so we kind of shifted. Uh, as I said, we were, we were very flat. Travis and Rhett and I were all equals in this company, you know, just wearing different hats. Um, so we switched it over, Travis became the CEO uh, Travis went on the road. He went to many Ethereum conventions, made speeches, tried to generate interest for Curio cards. I think he tried to meet with VCs, all the, the things we were talking about uh, yeah. that, you know, maybe I wasn't so good at doing or whatever. Travis went out and did them. Um, sadly, you know, in that period, we didn't make any more cards. Uh, there was a, a vote that I saw later on. I, I've looked around recently and it looks like they burnt an Ethereum to have a vote. Of, of what cards they should do next. And again, it's always tragic when you burn this money. Uh, there was a, like a counter, I think when Counterparty started, they, they burnt like 10 Bitcoins. And they were like, they were like this, is, this is a you know, symbolic, we are burning our ships and we are, right. this will give us value in the future. And what would have given them value is spending those 10 Bitcoins hiring programmers to build Counterparty or whatever the project yeah. was. So 
uh, much the same, I, I fear, with uh, them burning the Ethereum. But yeah, Curio Cards, we were, we're all about helping the artists. Uh, we wanted to give all the proceeds of the cards to artists. Uh, if we had, you know, if we had our way, we probably would have just bought the cards like from the artist if we'd had money. Right. Uh, but we didn't raise any money. Uh, we didn't raise any money with the cards. We didn't have any money personally. Uh, we weren't in a position to buy like even 500 cards from an artist sure. at a dollar. That was not uh, in our cards. Um, but um, it is, um, it's super interesting. And, and like just the point of um, Marisol or Max, now I know that he was actually the first person I talked to in this whole deal. Like he got back to me. I found Marisol Vengas had a Facebook account, non-active since like 2018. Didn't matter. I sent a message and within like five minutes, I got a message back. Right? I'm like, what are the odds of that? They're not even active, but whatever. Little did I know it's Max behind the scenes. Um, you know, got back to me right away. Like, yeah, I was involved in that. I know all about, you know, and um, it's super interesting. And obviously really cool people involved in the project because I've basically, other than Rhett, I've basically been able to chat with everybody um in the project which is really it's just special you were obviously you were able to get a, a nice team together um but again too early and it's wrong right um but how does that feel for you having it come back as a success what does that actually feel like for you well i, I just want to say we were also very well meaning on trying to pay the artists and there was a bit of an issue where luis wasn't paid or something and i think he got paid and I now know that all the artists have been added to the multi-sig, so they're going to get the percentage of the sales or whatever. So it really wasn't a project about benefiting artists, and we're not looking to really profit on this ourselves. But uh, yeah. so, so yes, Travis, Travis took over. We kind of left the cards out there in the vending machines. Uh, Travis edited the web page to remove the ability to go to the vending machines because you know we didn't want people to buy these you know, sadly worthless cards. Uh, you know, it wasn't it, you know, it was kind of like if we had left them out there, we would have been you know saying, hey, just keep buying these, and that's right. not what we were saying. Um, so you know, project goes to the back of our minds. Uh, I went and traveled around Europe and did a bunch of Bitcoin interviews and got to see uh, all the history stuff I'd always wanted to see. Uh, with a history degree and Rhett went on to do be private and some other projects. Travis went on to learn computer programming and get jobs comp uh, programming computers. So I think everyone you know, did well off of the project. Everyone continued on. It didn't destroy anyone's career. Um, but <laughs> then, you know, it kind of sits out there. So um, I already, you know, I was already kind of bitter about crypto kitties, right? Cause that comes out in the same year. And it's, it's different. It's a generative art project. You know, the kitty has a cigar, kitty has a hat, kitty has a hat and a cigar. Oh my God. Right. Um, you know, so it was very, it was different and it was unique and it was creative and, and I respected them. And I, I love the way they broke the Bitcoin, the Ethereum network. Uh, that was yeah. just super fun for me that this lighthearted goofy project had, had brought the whole thing down as I always <laughs> said that it would. Um, so, and it, they fixed it, but, uh, so yeah, that was kind of my big NFT where I was like, oh, we had this, you know? So you put it yeah. in the back of your mind. And then I remember in 2021 or 2020 and 2021, it starts to come back with the NFT and people are talking about it. So uh, I was drawn into Clubhouse at one point and I was like, oh, sweet. I'm going to meet Oprah and George Clooney. This is going to be sweet. Uh, but I guess it was already the Celebrity Clubhouse was already over. And the Clubhouse that I got was more like a lot of rooms about people talking about the Bitcoin price. And right. <laughs> a lot of like price discussion and professionals and non-professionals and they're talking it. And so in one of these rooms I was in with uh, Terrence Yang, uh, I met this woman, Emily Lazar, and she was very interesting. And we had a lot in common where we had both kind of created personas and characters to sell our art. And, you know, mm -hmm. I did mad Bitcoins. I have a goofy voice and a background and stuff. And what Emily had done is she'd worked together with a comic book artist uh, to recreate this character it's kind of like an undead soul reaper and she dresses up with the character and she has a band called september morning and they play songs that are written about the world of the character and the, the guy wrote a comic book too and i just thought it was a really great project and it, it brought all these things together and it especially reminded me of mad bitcoins where it's like yeah you know they weren't taking you seriously as a normal person so you became a character and uh emily was already very excited about nfts and was asking these clubhouse people about it because i think like a lot of artists, she was looking for a way in. And now six months, a year later, she's doing her own NFTs and she's having a lot of success and she's, you know, trans she's transforming her, her audience into an NFT audience and that kind of thing. Um, but she was like, yeah, what, what do you think of these NFTs? And 
I kind of casually just off. I was like, well, you know, in 2017, I made a bunch of these and we were referenced in the ERC 721 spec, blah, 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 blah. And, and the just dead silence from the room. Nobody understands what I'm saying. Nobody's, nobody's like you. They're not like, I'm going to go find this, blah, blah. No, they're like, they're like, this guy's crazy. So, um, so along the way, I, I forgot to mention, but uh, we were mentioned in the ERC 721 spec. So I'm a computer guy. I'm a scientist, a historian. Uh, I understand how science works. And I was just crazy honored to be referenced in this spec. And it's not a big reference, but they say that uh, the ERC, because there was this, the 20 tokens, which were basically ICOs. Mm -hmm. So when we did the 30 curio cards for a long time, we were afraid that we had done 30 ICOs. And right. they were going to come get us, right? And we screwed up. We didn't make any money. We were You've the, done a security, and here comes the SEC. Exactly. And plus, we didn't make any money, and we didn't have right. any lawyers. And I was like, this could be the worst. Because if you're successful, you can hire lawyers, and you yeah. can become a thing yeah. like CryptoKitties. But if you're not successful, and you just did 30 ICOs, you know, you're not going to tell people about it, <laughs> even if they do have pretty pictures on them or whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, in 30 the counts. 30, I know, exactly. That's the, exactly how they're going to see it. Actually, uh, 31. 31. Yeah, I know. Tammy is 17B. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so we're, you know, looking at the success of these other projects. But in uh, 721, they were looking to codify basically what Rhett and other people had developed, which was this uh, having a single card. You can't, I don't right. want half a card. I don't want a quarter of a card. You tear it up, it has no value. That's a card, right? That's different from like Bitcoin. You give me half a Bitcoin, you know, good deal. Let's do it. Let's yeah. do it again. Um, yeah. But, you know, half a card, I have nothing for. And all the other things like the vending machines, the way that they're sendable, the way that they have art or an a, a IPFS link, all of that was codified in 721 standard. And one of the things they said in their little paragraphs, they said, is this is a, a collectible card project similar to rare Pepe's or Curio cards. Right. And, and that's not a lot, right? But these are science guys. They keep their words very tight. They're not English people. It's not Dickens paid by the word here. So, you know, they're very tight. And if they say Curio cards, they must have looked at us. And yeah. again, for science, that's all we want. We're a part of the collection uh, process. We're part of the creation process. We are one little step in the thing. And that right there was enough for me. Like being in the yeah. spec, I was like, we did it. You know, we're in the spec. I, sure, we wanted that's to be awesome. a startup and all these things. But in the spec is good. Um, so things float along and they do the 1155 spec and they do all these new things and just the, the industry keeps growing. And you're kind of sitting on the side and you're like, I'm not, you know, getting anything for this. Why is this happening? I, I thought I had these ideas. I tried to pitch this. You feel you know, maybe I screwed it up or whatever. So sure. But at the same time, me be telling you about it isn't going to do it. Cause I, I tweeted about curio cards being in the spec and I'd blab to Emily in the clubhouse room and what am I going to do? I'm not going to get to these NFT people and tell them that I invented it or whatever. That's not going to work. Um, so I'm just sitting on the sidelines, kicking back, waiting to see what happens. And um, eventually, like you say, I did kind of get a heads up. I got a couple of strange Twitter messages where the guy was like, you got any cards? Got any cards? Like, yeah. And I, was, and I was like, what is this even about? Does he eat magic cards? Baseball cards? I, I do believe every artist uh, involved in the project got that same either tweet or email or direct messages, uh, they, which was interesting. They were these people who were doing that weren't looking for the contract. They were just saying, please give me some of these cards ahead of time. It's kind of funny how that works. That the, well, and and we, we have no idea. We're like, what even? Yeah what even cards do you want cure, cure cards <laughs> i don't even remember and um so that that happens and then um I know the big thing for me is i saw that that wikipedia entry and that we were in the wikipedia entry for crypto art and that people were starting to have this debate and this discussion about whether or not moon cats were number two or whether curio cards were number two and uh, what's great, you know, for me as a historian, I can weigh in and I can tell you my stories and all that, uh, but that doesn't matter. What matters sure. is in the Ethereum blockchain, you can see our transactions. It's completely yeah. provable now. It is the thing. So if there's one earlier than Curio Cards and it's in the blockchain, I'm not going to fight it. You know, I, I know, you know, what the truth is. Um, so I, I was just kind of waiting for that to come out and hoping that it was come out. You see these other things sell for millions and you're like, I want to sell for millions. You know, this sounds cool. Um, so, so it happens and the curio cards come out and like you say, they, they bought them all from the vending machine. And I was like, that's really exciting. What are they going to do now? And, and again, just looking at all the happy accidents that had to happen is that if the first guy who found it had just told no one 
and sure. quietly bought them all, there'd be no market for these because one yeah. person would have them all and he'd be in that position that I'm in where he's like, I want to tell you about these amazing cards. And everyone's like, no, I don't care. Like they don't have any interest, but because of the way the distribution happened, a bunch of, I don't know how many people, but random people bought it more than one person bought it. And this led to a position where now a bunch of people have the cards and of course they want to sell them. Right? They want to make their money back out of them. So we've got a bunch of fans that essentially what we were looking for in the old days. So a lot of this is like, <laughs> where were you four years ago? But at the yeah. same time, I'm so happy to see you because the fans of Curio Cards are making this all possible. They're building the galleries. They're building the leaderboards. They're helping us fix things. They set up the Discord. They built yep. a wrapper. I mean, all of this yep. is fans of Curio Cards, which is how we dreamed it would be in the old days. Um, but it's just this strange four-year gap where the, the fans are here and they're, they, well, it's all, as, a, as a business owner, it's almost impo you, you look upon businesses that are able to generate that kind of fervor um, and go, wow, that's a magic business. Cause you recognize how difficult it is to create that fervor. It's almost impossible. Um, well, and I, and I agree with what you it. said earlier about the Ethereum guy, where if he issued new land or if he issued new things, it doesn't matter. Cause that's issued in 2021. If we issued new right. curio cards today, even if they were ERC 20, like collectors technology, uh, they are not. It's that four yeah. year gap. It's that time that's made them presumably valuable. I don't know. Yes. No financial it advice is. and all that. But um, no, that's exactly what it is. And there are varying degrees of value and varying degrees of, you know, it, are things in bubbles. And of course, you know, uh, it's crypto is I think Daniel's advice again is just crypto giveth and crypto taketh away. Uh, the wisest advice is tends to be buy what you like, because um, then you're not disappointed if it goes down in value. Um, but you see some of the stuff, obviously, uh, you know, crypto punks, eight, $9 million for one. Um, but then I look into it further, right? I'm an investigative kind of guy. And just this morning, you know, I'm watching a people I, I follow and I'm friends with, you know, dozens of, of punk maximalists, you'd call them or whatever. Right. They're all in punk punk a million percent, right? Like anybody who doesn't own a punk isn't a real person. Right. And, but I, then I look and I look at all these punks and I start going through each individual punk and look at the number of times it's sold and it's never sold. You know, there are a number of punks, a lot of these low, lower end punks that have never sold, never traded, never bought, never sold. And there are whole, whole swaths that have sold once, you know, or twice. And it's like, is the same person buying and selling? Cause that's possible. Um, you know, this isn't the SEC regulated market. So is this all just a house of cards upon which, you know, it could tumble at any time? And I'm like, it's that's possible. But the thing is, when you have rich people involved, people with a lot of money who have paid a lot for their, you know, $200,000 card, their, you know, $200,000 punk, it supports the whole edifice, right? Um, so there's a certain thing where, do I think punks will fail now? No, I don't because $50 million has been spent buying up the top punks, right? So that kind of gives us like support structure to something which maybe doesn't have it before, right? And so can Curio Cards get that support structure? Um, it's possible. There's no guarantee though, right? So even though it is the first art project on Ethereum as of right now, you know, will it get that intense you know fervor and where you have the money involved to be able to support that um do i think there's a good chance absolutely i think there's a great chance of it and i hold a bunch of curio cards as sure i'm sure you do but there's no guarantee right i mean there is no guarantee it's crypto well one of the one of the unique neat things about nfts is that what you're really getting is a unique collectible and for me i've understood you know beyond you can see through the matrix and you can see the code it's a, it's a string of letters and numbers, right? That is what you are getting. It's provably rare and it's unique, uh, but that's also hard to trade, right? If you look at Bitcoin or Ethereum, essentially they're all like quarters. They're all like dollars. They're interchangeable, right? You'll trade any dollar for any other dollar. You don't really care. But if you spray painted something on that dollar and you signed it and you made it unique, you've made it unique, right? And these are provable right. unique, but you've also made it hard to trade. Everybody right. wants that quarter of Bitcoin, right? Everybody wants that because it's interchangeable. You could buy whatever you want with that. Not everybody wants that very unique thing that you've made. So while yeah. they are getting the uniqueness and from a collector, 
Like I've bought lots of things that like said they were collector's edition, but they were not collector's edition. They made millions of these things, right? Millions I'm a dumb, of, right, I'm yeah, a dumb yeah. kid, right? Collector's right. edition, one of a million. I think it's good, <laughs> right? That's not, that's not a collector's edition. There's tons of those, right? Even if a bunch right. get destroyed, there's still tons of them. Uh, so with these things, they really are rare, right? There's, there's five of them. Like it's provable. They really are collector's editions. They are five different tokens. They're different combinations of numbers and letters. Very unique. You now, pretty much uh, the Bitcoin addresses are like uh, the grains of sand on the beach multiplied by stars in the sky, right? So there's right. a lot of addresses. So you're not really going to hit the same address twice. It's not the same thing for these tokens. There's a lot of potential tokens. But that one that you have, Curio number eight, you know, one of 200 or whatever, that is that one. That is the one. Uh, yep. that also might make it hard to sell. Uh, it's a very yeah. tight market, right? It's very only, only one person, you know, going to be interested in that one of that set of that thing. Okay. So I, I worry about that for the collectors and I worry about the, the frothiness. It, it goes up and it goes down. Um, but I, I go back to that collector's thing that I have myself, where if I get a new REM poster, like someone else might not value that, but I'm like another REM poster for the collection. I have seven of the nine posters. They're in decent condition of this and this. I can put them in frames. I can display them. I can keep them. I can try to buy the last two. You know, what, am I, what happens when I get nine? What happens when I have a full set? Nothing, right? Nothing changes, even though in the code, it would have been cool if we could have put a gold border around your account or anything like that. That's, that's code stuff we can do. But as far as what actually changes in your account or in my shelf of books or whatever my collection is, uh, nothing changes. Uh, but I love that collector's dynamic. I love buying the packs, buying the boosters, uh, getting the box sets, getting a random collection of singles and sorting them through. And with these digital things, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, I got to try out Atomic Assets uh, that runs Wax. And uh, my friend Max uh, sent me a link and the link was full of cards and you popped it. And, and pretty soon I had garbage pail cards and I had other <laughs> cards I don't know about and all these things. And I'm looking at the garbage pail cards and uh, I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't an original image. This is the tiger King. This is 2020, right? This is modern image. And then I realized they were minting new garbage pail card images from new artists. And then I, then I took my wax and I started buying garbage pail kids cards <laughs> for no reason and for a dollar. And I don't think they're going up, but I wanted the cool pictures and I was supposed to be making, I was supposed to be learning how to make NFTs with this wax. But instead I was like garbage pail kids, garbage pail kids. So I just, I just think it's great that there's collectors out there. I'm excited that there's curio card collectors, whether, whether they're in it for the money or they're in it for the art or they want the full set or a little of both and all that, all three together. That's totally fine. Uh, like I'm psyched that they're there. I'm glad that they're doing it. Of course, I want it to get bigger. We have like 400 people trading Curio cards on OpenSea. I want that to go up. Uh, sure. I don't know about the value up or down and all that. It's been interesting to me as a uh, like an observer of this. It's not so much the art that was on the cards. <laughs> it's how the cards were found and distributed. Uh, I Absolutely. thought that Crypto Graffiti is a big artist. I thought his cards would be more valuable. But because of the distribution, his cards are common and rare. Um, right. The Phineep cards that are early on kind of have a clip -y look to them, but some of them are very rare and very valuable. Uh, Daniel's cards are, are hand drawn. Like it looks to me like he's bored in class, really, and, and he has a geometric mind, you know. And yeah, exactly. but at the same time, they're very rare. They're low numbers. The way they were distributed, they weren't in the vending machines for the guys to find. Uh, they're crazy rare now. So it's interesting to see that the artwork doesn't necessarily uh, make the rarity. Uh, but yeah. who knows, maybe it flips in the future. A big crypto graffiti collector comes along and he's like, these, these are too cheap. Scoops them all I'm up. Getting them all. Yeah. And then once he has them all, the market changes. Um, so we have a lot of potential ups and downs in this. Uh, I don't know if the whole NFT thing goes up and down. I, I've said to people before, I think that if anything's going to break these NFTs, it's going to be Curio Cards. Uh, we don't have any celebrities. We don't have any money. We don't have any backing. There's nobody to make this market for us. Uh, if it happens, I agree with you. I think there are, all the collectible things are there. They're old. They're original. They're interesting. There's a good story. Like all mm -hmm. of that is there. So if you, if you value things on the collector side, I like curio cards. But yeah. as far as like having a big platform, having hype, having celebrities, having millions of dollars in sales, we don't have that yet. And there's right. an interesting dynamic here where I think to get into the mainstream media, 
We need to sell for a million dollars. But to sell for a million dollars, we need to get into the mainstream media. So I don't know how that's going to happen. It's if it's a, Yeah, it's a out. bit of a chicken and egg. Um, I, but I just, you know, I, I, I go back to CryptoPunks, which are the runaway success. I'm using air quotes now, runaway success of the NFT market. It took years for them. And you could, as of last November, you know, uh, five, six months ago, still get them for 50 bucks, a hundred bucks. Like it was still cheap. You know, it's only been in the last six months that you have this massive explosion. Uh, so my, my gut with Curio specifically is it may not be this cycle. It's probably not going to be this cycle. It's the next cycle where people are all of the, the millions of NFTs that are being put out now go by the wayside. We get a second NFT cycle where people rediscover like the real high end pieces of, of NFTs. And that's when people rediscover Ethereum, Curio cards, even maybe Mooncats. And all of these have a, have a, a new, uh, new found kind of cycle of, of exuberance, if you will. And, um, but we'll see. I do think it comes like we talk. I, I love talking about human nature, collectability, collections. All I have to do is look at my kid and kids in general, which tells me it's a core like part of human nature is this idea of collecting. And, you know, we all have it to varying degrees. And if you get enough wealthy people uh, involved in the space or involved in your particular project, uh, it just happens naturally. And they, you know, almost support the entire if infrastructure because once they, like you said, once they get into it, once they decide, oh, Crypto Graffiti, he's one of the, you know, founding people in the NFT space, in the digital art space. I'm just going to go buy up because all of his stuff is super cheap. I'm just going to buy them all up. Uh, all of a sudden now people start saying, well, why should I sell it when they're all getting bought up? And then the price just shoots through the roof and that's the way it goes, you know? Well, that, uh, mentioning your kid reminds me of another one of my early collections and, uh, how I was of course manipulated by mainstream media and marketing to collect these. Um, but I still have, of course, sadly, and, uh, I love, um, the McDonald's toys and oh, every yeah. week you had to go to McDonald's to get the right toy and you had to bug your parents <laughs> and they didn't have it. And you would want to collect the four set. You want to have Miss Piggy oh, and Kermit and Gonzo and Fozzie and all the Muppets. Right. And they, they had you as a kid and you didn't know, you didn't know that yeah, McDonald's yeah. was like factory food and it's all chemicals and all this kind of thing. You had no idea. You're just like, I want to go get that toy every week. No other yeah. restaurant seems to realize that I want toys, not food. And, um, <laughs> You know, that, that was one of the big collecting things for me, I think, was those those little toys. Totally. I, I connect with that a thousand percent because I never got toys when I went to McDonald's as a kid. Like we, you know, although we were fine, we when we went to McDonald's, it was for food. Right. <laughs> I never I did, got a had to order off the adult life, right? menu, the adult menu. Oh, but my kid, we would go because here in Costa Rica, they don't have great playgrounds. But McDonald's has the full on like kid area right so i'm telling you we would go once twice a week my kid when it was whatever power rangers time he had to make sure he got the red one the blue one the green one the he had a whole box of uh yeah well, and i feel sorry for parents because like what's the difference the red one doesn't matter the green one doesn't matter but i grew up with ninja turtles i'm like leonardo is very different from oh, it Thomas matters Turtle. what are you talking <laughs> about like they have totally different personalities blah, blah, blah. and uh yeah I, I feel sorry for the parents and the collectors and the future, but um, I think it's super exciting. We can have you know garbage pail kids on wax and curio cards on open sea and crypto kitties and all these other projects. I think there's more than enough room for everybody, and I'm excited for everybody to be collecting and to see them in people's wallets. Uh, one of the things on open sea you can do if you click through to some of the people that have bought curio cards, it shows you their other cards. So me yep. as a collector, I'm like, oh, this guy's into these things and he's into those things too. And, oh, he only has one of those. And you know, it's, yeah. it's just so fun to be able to do all these things that I wanted to do in the beginning is to have these gallery display pages of the cards, to have these people that were interested in building sets, both like one, two, three, and like, you know, full 30 card sets. And, and yep. they don't have to be rewarded. You don't get to go to the 30 card club or you don't get a million dollars, whatever, but 
uh, I saw the first couple days, it was uh, the funniest thing because they did that that Saturday Night Live NFT uh, rap video like Eminem. Sure. And, and I loved it. And I just totally blown away by Pete Davidson and the work they put together. I've always been a Saturday Night Live fan. Um, but that was Saturday night. And then Sunday, they open up the curio cards for trading for real on OpenSea. And they had some ups and downs in there. We don't have to talk about the rappers. But um, it was open and it was real and you could buy them and sell them. And it was just it's been really exciting since then. Like there's really a market to it. And the, the discord was all chatting and going oh, and yeah. everyone was excited to buy and sell cards. And um, pretty much immediately after that happened, and this is always kind of what we dreamed of when we started this project is people started posting on Twitter that they had completed the set. There's yeah. at least two people. I think it's moon and Kian and they're both like early people in the project and they couldn't do it in the old days. Cause we didn't have an exchange and we didn't have a way to really sell the cards other than just, you know, I'll sell you a card, you know, trust me. Um, mm -hmm. And that they were able to get on this exchange. It was a legit exchange. It worked. They gave them Ethereum. They got cards. They put them in their set. And then they did exactly what I thought they'd do. They, they took a picture of it and they posted it on the internet. And that's whether the project's in, in the Wikipedia or it's expensive or it's important or it gets me jobs or whatever. People collected sets of the things that we made to be collected into sets. So... Yep. That that's the whole thing, all right there. Like I, you know, I don't need anything else. So that's that's pretty uh, awesome. I, I thought that one of the community members. I mean, you talk about community members being involved. One of them built a thing where you can see a leaderboard, right? You probably checked it out too. It's incredible, where you can see everybody and how many. So the top people, how many people have all thirty or thirty-one? Because most people consider that seventeen B uh, also a card. So thirty-one, and then how many people are getting close and all that sort of stuff. It's um. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, and there was a, a sarcastic comment in the Discord where the guy was like, make a leaderboard and trick people into buying more. Ha, ha, ha. I see right through you. And I was like, exactly. But <laughs> exactly. also, exactly. Like, this is it. Like, we put them into sets. Like, we group them with the artists. If you want the Crypto Pop collection, buy those three. If you want yep. the Robeck collection, buy those three. But if you want the whole set, and we clearly numbered them, we, we wanted yep. to do backs and stuff. Baseball cards have backs, but um, you know, we couldn't and stuff, technology. But they did have that number prominently on the front. These are together as a set. So, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. Hey, pe it. people love, you know, and I, I don't know why we discount it as like something bad or whatever, but people love to flex. They love to be like, look what I got. I mean, they do. This is. It, I don't know a human alive who doesn't like that and to, to deny it as not part of our humanity or something negative. I mean, come on, man, who are we? We're, uh, and I've know, heard a lot of people say day. like that people are only interested in digital things cause we're stuck home. And my friend Ben said recently how we we'd advanced like five years of internet in the past year, because all these people who weren't digital natives, they weren't like me and you, they weren't like internet, internet, internet. They were stuck right. at home. And pretty soon every day they were like, you know, what's really interesting that internet that's where i chat to people that's where i do all my things like i just and I, and maybe if i had my collection on there like i i go traveling i go on an airplane i'm not taking any baseball cards with me right but if we get yeah. there and you're like hey show me your curio cards or show me your garbage pail kids on wax or whatever i'm like i got them i got them right here i got them on my laptop i got them on my phone you know i can show you my cards and people are like oh that's just a fad because of covid and they're staying home but if you look at these kids and, you know, we, we marketed this. We tried to market it towards a market. Uh, kids want everything on their phone. And this was one of my big Bitcoin things for a long time. I'd be like, you know, you have money in your wallet. What the heck is that? I have money on my phone. Like I'm from the internet. I have money on my phone. I send it to people over the internet. You know, that's it. Like, it's not, why would I want your stupid paper money? And I, yeah. I like, I like arts. I like prints of arts and posters and stuff on my wall but it doesn't have to be the real original and I don't have to carry that around with me and all that. But with these NFTs, the collectible that you have, that string of letters and numbers, that is the original. That is the right. valuable one. Like when I'm showing you on my little phone, the, the gallery distribution of my tokens in my account, I yeah. own whatever that thing is. And there may be thousands yeah. of them or there may be 20, um, but you know, I own it. So uh, yeah, I think it's really I, exciting I, I, that I can say these things and people know what I'm talking about. 
and they're not just yeah. like, I'm going to make a copy of that JPEG. And uh, then they's like, you must be into drugs and the Silk Road because you're into Bitcoin. And, you know, and it's just like our whole conversation, we can't go anywhere. But now with these NFTs, I can say these things and you already believe them. You've already seen it proven by other artists and other platforms and projects. And then we can build on top of it. And that's, that's yeah. what I'm happy about the conversation we're having. The, all the Curio card, all the NFT discussion and conversation, it's building on top of this. It's rewarding artists. Some people are making lots of money. Some people might lose lots of money. Um, but I hope that the artists get rewarded and I hope that it makes more art. And that's why I was so excited when you described earlier, earlier your, your waifu project that you found that he's just an artist in the Indonesia and he has nothing and he doesn't know if he should make art. And suddenly the internet is like, make us more art. And yeah. if he listens to that, that big feel the dreams voice out there and he makes them more art, I think he'll be successful. And that's exciting that at least one person, you know, has found their calling and made their connection and can feed their family and, and relax and that kind of thing. So yeah, more of that. Let's, let's do that like a thousand times more. So. Do more. And well, give me what you see aside from art. Give me one or two things that you think are a future of this sort of NFT technology uh, as, as you see it. Uh, I like the ticketing examples. Uh, a lot of the problems though with like, like you were saying deeds or I say ticketing, uh, there's an external component. Like, yes, I have the golden ticket. Yes, I can go to any concert, but if I dress in a very offensive manner or if I don't wear clothes at all, or if I smell really bad or something, there's a reason why they wouldn't let me into that concert, right? The right. golden NFT ticket is not really golden. Right. It's, it's dependent on other things. And the same thing for land and deeds. Like if a warlord comes in, it's not a problem of your land being on the blockchain or your land was in a SQL database. Warlord doesn't care about the land rights of the previous people. Uh, it's right. not the a, connection a, between the physical reality and online reality. Yeah. How so do those two connect. Right? Yeah. All of those are all like tentative connections. Like when they shredded that Banksy. It's like, yeah, that's kind of related to the NFT. I mean, I guess it's like a Rube Goldberg machine and the shredder launched the button and pushed the thing and then it's all connected, but that's a very tentative connection. Uh, right. The things I'm more interested in would be, and again, I'm not really in favor of this because I'm a computer person. I think we should copy everything. Like it's exciting to me that I could give you a copy of the Beatles and you could listen to them. Like it's so much easier than it used to be with like records or cassettes or whatever, but uh, digital access control. The ability to give someone an early peek at a song, give your top five fans the early access to the song. You can monitor it. They have the token. They give it to their friends. They could listen. Nobody can listen at the same time. And then later on, you release the song normally. Because if you mess with people too much, they're going to record it off their headphones and they're going to re-release it. And sure. people talk about all the time that Wu-Tang album that was bought by the big pharma guy, and he was right. the only one that could hear it. And I, it's great that Wu-Tang sold the album. They got lots of money. I, I respect them and that. But uh, I want people to hear it. I want people to be able to experience the music and the album. And for me, one of the great things about computers and especially MP3s in, and video compression is that it, it brought everyone the music. And the problem now is like, what music do I listen to? What movie do I watch? That's right. And I don't want to go back to a scarce thing where you have to have the token to play the music and you have to have the token to watch the movie and stuff. That's not getting better for me, but I do want the artist to be supported. So I, I would be interested in more things that are digital, where when you say like access to the song, it means 24 seven, 365, you have the token, you have access to the song. Um, sure, they got to keep their databases and their websites online and all that. Maybe 10 years from now, the Space Jam website goes down. And I don't have access to the song anymore. But uh, that kind of thing is interesting to me. And I, I don't know. I, I'm sure people are doing that. There's everyone in the space is innovating all over the place. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in those things. But just even then kind of tentatively interest because I still I like the openness of the Internet and sharing the fun. Yeah, you, I mean, it, it's interesting. It's like, are we going to get into a kind of micro payments world where you have to pay it for everything, which kind of never took off on any sort of level, you know, before, but before there was more limiting factors, right? Um, well, it seems like now we could actually get to that sort of scenario. Um, but who knows where it's going to go? I, I, t I tend to lean towards free, uh, because free tends to be our model. But who knows where it's going to go? I know there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things to figure out what people actually want. Um, most of them are failing, but that doesn't mean they're not moving us forward as they fail. Um, 
and I try to describe it like just the simplest NFT to my, like my mom, who's not involved at all. And she would say, why would I ever want to pay for that when I could get it for free? And I say, well, why would you want to pay for a Gucci bag rather than a fake bag? Because to most people, the un an initiated, it's the exact same bag. Why would you pay $2,000 more for the Gucci bag? And even that, she's like, I don't understand it. <laughs> but for most people, they get that. Uh, even even that, even that's a layered thing because at one point that's you right. say maybe Gucci has better materials and better craftsmanship right. and quality, but then there's also this whole layer of uh, logo and image. They are stamping right. their logo on something. They have a lot of cachet in in just that logo. I've seen a friend of mine bought a T-shirt and it said Gucci and it was sixty bucks or maybe right. two hundred. Right, it was a T-shirt. Right. I buy them right. for like 10 bucks or five bucks or whatever. I was like, what you spent? And it was white too. And I'm like, I can't right. really white. like that's going to be mustard and ketchup covered by the end of the week. I'm not spending 200 bucks on a t-shirt that I'm going to run through the thing. So yeah, no, I don't understand that kind of thing, but people, again, people do, they value those things. They buy them, they collect them. They, they'll put Gucci shoes, Gucci watch with a Gucci belt. Uh, they'll feel good. That's enough. That's enough for yep. them to collect it, for them to pay it, to have that value. Uh, people collect watches. They collect all kinds of things. And uh, I think this is just one more digital collectible. It's definitely gotten very, 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 very crazy. Like, uh, I can't keep up with the stories. It was like uh, Gronkowski did one and Mahomes. Oh, yeah. And then uh, both the Manning brothers and Brady the next day. And, oh, it's a full uh, money grab. I mean, it's yeah, like, and then it's I saw a magical it, time. Yeah. A Mark yeah. Cuban, who I thought I thought would be with us on the Bitcoin like early when we needed him, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day. And he mocked us the whole time and said it was yeah. nonsense. And then now somehow he's been hit by a bolt of lightning uh, with Ethereum and NFTs. And he's still not crazy about Bitcoin, which I disagree on. But uh, he put up a picture and he's like, these are the, the athletes, the Dallas, Mathle Dallas uh, Mavericks, the athletes. Here they are in the training room. We all have notepads and laptops out. And he's like, I'm teaching them about NFTs. <laughs> then, then, of course, as things are, he's like, I've just made an NFT of my picture of me teaching the Dallas Mavericks about NFTs. And, and, and it's great. And it's like, give Mark Cuban more money, whatever you want to do. But uh, he's crazy late to this. And, and But at the same time, he's bringing all these athletes along. Uh, they're probably getting pretty good information. I think just like the artists, the athletes uh, should go ahead and issue anything they can if you want to sell something to your fans. And, and again, your fans appreciate it. Your fans value it. Like if, gosh, I didn't want to put this idea out there, but if, if REM made an NFT, I'd probably have to buy it. And I hate sure. that. Like I'm not looking to be in the market for these things. I'm looking as an artist to like figure out how I can sell my photos or how I can sell my stuff for this or how I can help other people sell their photos and yep. sell their stuff for this. Cause that's what I think the value is. But um, yeah, for well, an the one, one thing I mean, I, I've talked about it a, a number of times is that look, NFTs, what they've done is they've allowed people, this is the access point to the blockchain, to blockchain technology for most people. This is like, you see the fervor. This is, has been the entrance point for most, for people to the blockchain and to blockchain technology for whatever reason. And it just connected for who knows whatever reason. Um, and I, part of it is money like this, this idea that you can somehow make a lot of money very quickly or get money for free. I mean, all these things with moon cats and all this sort of stuff, it was basically free money. You go as if you had enough money in, in your wallet to go grab some, you could turn around and flip that and make 10 X in a week, you know? And so nothing motivates humans uh, more than that. I mean, there are a few motivators more uh, profound than free money and people will run and do whatever, you know, for that. And it's been a big driver, you know, well, and a, a, lot of people, a lot of people thought it would be Dogecoin that would serve that. And in a lot of ways, Doge does. It brings new mm -hmm. people in. They're excited about it. It goes up and down. They have the whole kind of miniature Bitcoin experience. And then hopefully they get into Bitcoin and the other stuff. Uh, if it happens the same way with NFTs, if people's first, if their new first Bitcoin story is somebody sent me a garbage pail kit in my mail and I clicked on the link and it was there. And then I sent it to someone else and that helped them understand Bitcoin and what we're really talking about is a public key cryptography. 
you know, sending yep. those messages around, having the addresses, all of this makes great sense if you encrypted your email in the 90s, uh, but not everyone did that. Believe me, I refused to <laughs> communicate with people that weren't encrypted for a while. And you know what happens? Everyone stops emailing you. So yeah, yeah it was great. Like you could have the high level of encryption, you can have security and privacy, but you won't speak with anyone. So uh, <laughs> exactly. it doesn't quite work out for you. But um, no, if that's their first way into Bitcoin and their first way into Ethereum and crypto and whatever, Great, let's do it. Like, bring them all on board. I want everybody in this. Um, from the beginning, Mad Bitcoins has been like, let's get more people into this. Uh, and I talk to, you know, my people, the nerdy computer people and the fun people that would enjoy my humor and stuff. And other people need to talk to their groups. And uh, in a non -a, non a group way or whatever, but one of my favorite groups on Clubhouse is uh, Black Bitcoin Billionaires. And anyone is welcome there. Everyone can go there. I go there, obviously. And, um, but they are great and they are helping people with Bitcoin education. They're teaching about hardware wallets and they're teaching them, you know, kind of how to avoid altcoins or at least to see them as different. And you can go out and play the casino if you want, but you know, sure. we're selling the Bitcoin here as a safety thing for you and your family. And they have a great thing about trying to get people to get a million Satoshis, which used to be 300 bucks, which was kind of easy. And now is 600 bucks, which is a little harder. Um, yep. maybe half million is a good goal now, but, um, just to get that, put it into a paper wallet or a hardware wallet and put it secure and just to not sell it. And I just think they're doing great and it's a specialized thing. So much as if the NFTs can reach all the art people and all the collector people, and we can bring all of them into Bitcoin and Ethereum and whatever else, I don't you know, do what you want, but, um, it's great. I, it let's more people, bigger boats, bigger ships, bigger conventions. Someday we'll get to go outside again, even. Um, but, uh, yeah, all of that, but yeah, it was a great conversation, Adam, and I'd love to do it again sometime in a couple yeah. months. We'll see how this space, uh, turns out. And if there's, well, more congratulations to you, about. honestly, because you were there, obviously you've been, you've been involved in the space for a long time, but to be involved with Curio at the beginning, uh, congratulations for doing that, man. Good, good on you. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, yeah, as you said earlier, it's the strangest thing to be in a project four years ago and to, to kind of fail at it, to not have great success. And then four years later, everyone's like, we love what you did. You made some beautiful <laughs> stuff. Like you put it on the blockchain, it has some art, has all these stories, like, and, and, and there's play for everybody. And again, Rhett, Rhett coded it. Travis helped spread it. I was a part of the team too. My friend Rick was a part of the team as well. And just all of these people contributed. San Francisco, the Bitcoin meetup contributed. Uh, these, yep. these made it possible. I couldn't do this on my own. I'm not one person or other. I'm, I'm a team of people. So, yeah. um, and even now with the collectors and the people who are building things and the people who built the wrapper and the leaderboard, uh, they do their own work by their own choice. And I just hope everyone benefits in this and they all get uh, full sets. So good stuff, man. Thanks so much for taking the time with me, man. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Take care, man. This episode was sponsored by NFT Ventures Miami. Become an NFTV artist. Sign up today. Easy bit. Easy bit. Easy bit. Bitcoin ATMs. Easy bit.